Hi everyone. The Catholic Church has a problem, a big problem. There was a recent survey done actually about three years ago, just before the pandemic, and the, the survey showed that there are 1.4 billion Catholics in the world. 1.4 billion people say they're Catholic. But in that same survey, only one in eight actually admitted that they attended Mass on a regular basis, weekly at least. One in eight, that's 12 and a half percent. It's a very low number. What that means is that we, who are ministers in the Catholic Church, are not doing a good job at explaining the beauty of the Mass and the importance of it. The Mass is Jesus inviting us to a meal, to sit around the table with Him, to pray together with Him and with our community members, and to sit in the physical presence of Jesus. That's amazing. Think about all the other religions out there. Nobody has the same thing that we do. We need to get that message out. We need to let people know. People make up lots of excuses for not going to Mass. I'm too busy, or I don't like the preacher, or I don't understand the, pre the, t the uh, priest's accent, or it's only, Mass is only for old people or sick people. Uh, there's just all kinds of things. I'm bored, you know, it's just not exciting, or I'm only going because they want to receive my money. The people make up all kinds of excuses. The fact is, they would come to Mass if they fully understood how beautiful it is. When I was a little kid, we used to march into church, and I say march because there were 10 of us in my family, and my mother and father would march us in, and we were kind of proud that we could take up two pews, two whole pews of these little kids. And I went because my parents told me to go. They didn't exactly force me, but they said it was special and something that I needed to do. And I trusted them. I thought it was the right thing to do. But I didn't understand it fully, and I wanted to understand it for myself. So I picked up a book. There are these things called missalettes in the pews. And when I first was able to read, I started looking at it and going through it. And all of a sudden, I can see the prayers that the priest was saying. I can see the readings that are being read word for word. And I'm like, wow, this is really meaningful. This is something special. And that is what I want to say to you. Mass is not an entertainment function. You're not going to Mass to be entertained by a wonderful homilist. You're not going to Mass to hear beautiful music and be inspired by it. All those things happen. If they do happen, it's beautiful. But what you get out of the Mass is what you put into it, like I did. I read that thing and I looked at all the prayers and I understood it. That's what you need to do. And it's, I'm going to say that several times throughout, and when I'm referring to this book especially, there are a lot of ways to see what's in the, in, in the uh, missalette. You can go online, different ways, I'll explain all those. But you get out of the Mass what you put into it. And I'll finish this introduction uh, with this. When I do baptisms, I tell the exact same thing to all the families, especially the parents and godparents. When they baptize their kid, their role is to get that child to learn what it's like to know God, to get to know God in their lives so that they want to be with Him. The only way to get to know God is to spend time with Him. And that's it. That's the most important. You can pray and so on. That's spending time with Him, but spending time at Mass. Okay? So I tell the story that, you know, I'm a, I'm a deacon. I'm married. I have two children. If one of my sons came to me and said, Dad, I love you, but I don't have to visit you anymore. I don't have to spend time with you. I want to think about you a lot. You're going to be on my mind a lot. I might call you. I might even FaceTime you so I can see your face. But I don't have to visit you. If one of my sons says that to me, he's out of my will. That's it. I don't know him anymore. He doesn't know me. He's not my child. Don't get cut out of God's will. Take advantage of the Mass. Take advantage of what it's all about. Spend time with Him. All right? So now let's dive into what the parts of the Mass are, and hopefully by the time we're finished, you'll see how beautiful it actually is. Okay? So I mentioned there's this book, The Missalette. Okay? Start with it. Look at what it's, it says on the cover. Ordinary time, okay? It's from June to December. So now we know what period it's covering, okay? You can also find all this information, the order of the Mass and all the readings and everything else at the uh, site for the U.S. Catholic Conference of Catholic Bishops, 
usccb.org, okay? Excellent web, uh, website and there's a lot of information and you can see all of that online. You can even play with it on your, use it on your phone while you're in mass. Just don't do social media or anything else and keep your phone silenced, all right? I do that a lot when I go to other churches and I'm not in my own parish and I need to new, see the readings. I don't have to pick up the book. I just go right to my phone. Okay, the Magnificat online also has similar information, especially the readings. So good resources that you can go to. So you pick up the book and you find out what it's covering, right? And it has all different things. There are different seasons in the church, in the, in the church calendar. The church calendar starts with Advent, okay? Advent starts around the first week of December and it goes for several weeks. And then after that, we go back into ordinary time. And then we go into Lent. And then we go right from Lent into the Easter season. Easter season ends at Pentecost, and after that we go back to ordinary time again, okay? So know where you are, what season you're in, and that helps you. And we look at the book, and there's a table of contents. Wow, beautiful thing. It talks about the order of the Mass, all the different parts, the readings. There are pages and pages with all the readings from that particular period that are covered in here. Okay, so we'll start going through that. One last thing, uh, sort of general information. It's the butt of many jokes on TV shows and movies. You sit, you stand, you kneel, you sit, you stand, you kneel. When do you sit? When do you kneel? All these different things, and they make fun of it, right? There is a purpose for all of that. You stand when you pray. A lot of times the priest will say, let us pray. You stand up. The beginning of the Mass is the introductory rite. That's one long prayer. We stand for the whole thing. We kneel when we venerate, and that's really during the um, Eucharistic prayer. It's a long part of the Mass. We'll talk about it. And you kneel after you receive communion, during the communion uh, distribution, and so on. All the rest of the time, you sit. Okay? So there's nothing really to it. You stand when you pray, you, you kneel when the Eucharistic prayer is going on, and then you sit the rest of the time. Okay? If you have a kid and you want to take him out, you can stand in the back. That's always welcome. But then again, that's something also to say. A child's sound in the church is one of the most beautiful sounds you can hear. So enjoy it. Enjoy the fact that those parents are suffering <laughs> by bringing their kid in and they're sitting through it and that kid would be better off much later in life. Okay, so let's get into it. And I have my notes here in front of me. So if you don't mind, I'm going to look down every now and then and just make sure I reference it. It's about five pages worth of notes, so I don't have it all memorized. So let's get into it. The introduction, or the introductory rites, is made up of several parts, okay? And I'll look at my notes when I go through it. There's an entrance song. And now every Mass has a theme, okay? Every week there's a special theme to the Mass, and you'll see it in the readings and so on. But the music coordinator, if they're good, and they should be good, they will choose music that goes with the theme. So listen to the opening song, and that will help you to understand what the Mass is going to be about that day. You can sing it if you want. There's, a, there's no songs in this particular missalette, but there are songs in uh, music books and things like that. If you look up on the altar, there's usually numbers. Those numbers are not there for any other reason other than to tell you what the number of the song is. So you can use that, look at the book in the, in the hymnal, and you pick out the song. If you don't choose to sing, you know, he who sings prays twice. It's a beautiful thing to do. But if you don't want to, at least read the words and then you'll understand. The words are beautiful in these. These are prayers that are just simply put to music, okay? So there's an entrance song. Then there's the procession in. The ministers all process in, the uh, altar servers, the, uh, there's someone usually holding a crucifix. Maybe if it's fancy at times, someone's holding incense, someone holding candles. Then there's the uh, lectors and the Eucharistic ministers, if you have them. And then a deacon, sometimes uh, if they have a deacon, they'll hold the gospel, the book of the gospels, and, and pr process in with that. And then the priest or the concelebrants, okay? When they get to the altar, the, everybody bows. And it's not the um, candle holder and the um, uh, crucifix holder don't have to bow. They're holding that, and it's kind of dangerous if you're holding flame to actually bow. So they don't bow, but everybody else looks at the altar. We're not bowing to the tabernacle or any other thing. We're bowing to the altar because Jesus sits at the altar as the heart of the assembly. 
and we're reverencing the altar for that special purpose. And then after it's reverence, but the bow or even a kneel, the priest and the deacon will go around and actually kiss the altar to venerate it. Okay, very special stuff. Then there will be a greeting. Uh, the priest will say a few words. He'll start with the sign of the cross. All right, we're there in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the Trinity, and they'll start. They can read the entrance antiphon, which is, again, in the book. There's a couple of pages of entrance antiphons, and there's one for every week in the period. And you can go through that, find the week, and, and do that. Or the priest will simply say some words that will relate to the theme of the Mass. Okay? So now that you have that, um, we will uh, read the, the uh, antiphon or hear it, listen to that, and the priest will then go right into the penitential rite. There are, the penitential rite is a beautiful section of the chair of the Mass because it gives you a chance to understand your, and to acknowledge your sinfulness. All right? Think about the things that you've done that hurt Jesus. And it's a chance to get absolution for that. The priest will actually say something at the end to absolve of those sins. It doesn't replace confession in that it doesn't get rid of mortal sins. If you're in a state of a grave sin, you need to go to confession for that. But if you have the, you know, the venial sins, the sins that are of human nature, the sins of our humanness, our humanity, that we go to, uh, we get, conf uh, I'm sorry, we get forgiven at that point, okay? There are three different types of penitential rites. If there's a deacon, they will, and the priest can do this too, they can lead you in the uh, f r prayers called the Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy. They'll say something, they'll say Lord have mercy, people will respond to Lord have mercy, and so on. Uh, there's the confidior, which is the I confess to Almighty God, and so on. Keep in mind, when you're saying those, you're actually, especially the confidior, you're, acknowledge you're asking others to pray for you and you're asking Our Lady to pray for you, keep that in mind. Pray for them as you're hearing the prayers and as you're saying them, okay? And the last form of a penitential rite is the sprinkling of water. It's not that uh, done that often. It's one of my favorite types, actually, because I get to really squirt people with water. Um, it's have a little fun, but it's a very serious part of the Mass. And if they want, it's sort of like a, a baptism, people being cleansed by holy water. And that also is a penitential rite. It's an important part because we are there to receive the Lord. We need to be in a state of grace to receive Him. Otherwise, we're not giving Him the proper format for Him to come into us. So, or, or, yeah, so we want to forgive, get, ask for forgiveness and be forgiven of our sins. Okay? After that, we've been forgiven, we've been greeted, we feel really good and comfortable with how things have progressed. And so we sing the Gloria, or we say the Gloria. The Gloria is a prayer that is really beautiful. You can go through it. It's in the book as well. It's word by word. Glory to God in the highest and on earth. Peace to people of goodwill. Beautiful. And it goes on and on. It's a chance for us to praise God, but not only praise Him, but also ask for His mercy yet again. It's constant acknowledgement of our sinfulness and our need for His mercy. Okay? And He gives us that mercy. So it's a beautiful uh, prayer. It's in the book. I would recommend you, even if you're looking it online, even if you have it memorized, read it. There's nothing like looking at the words. When you have something memorized, you tend to go through it so quickly. It's like saying a fast, Our Father, Hail Mary. Do you actually spend the time to really understand what you're saying? Okay? When you read it, you're looking at it with your eyes, you're saying it with your mouth, your brain is processing two different ways, you get a lot more out of it, okay? So don't be ashamed to say, you know what, I have it memorized, but I'm actually gonna use the book. You don't have to feel proud in front of anybody that you're reading from the book. Take a chance, take a look at it, and pray along and have it more, be more meaningful for you, okay? After the Gloria, we have the last part of the opening rite. People are still standing. We do the opening prayer. And again, the opening prayer is in the book. There are pages and pages and pages of them for every week in the Mass, uh, in, this, in the uh, calendar. It's again in line with the theme of the Mass, and it's a set prayer for each Mass. And it's also called the Collect. The priest has his hands outstretched. He's saying this prayer, but he's collecting the prayers of all the people in the community and bringing them and presenting them to God. Okay? So another beautiful part of the Mass. Now, people sit, we go into the Liturgy of the Word. 
The liturgy of the word, another important part of the mass, is God speaking to us. It's all taken from the Bible. The Bible is God's communication of what he wants, what he believes, what he wants us to do to us through the prophets, through holy people, okay, and through Jesus himself. There are several parts of the liturgy. There's the Old Testament reading that's taken from the section of the Old Testament, Exodus, Genesis, all these different books, Isaiah, a lot of different books and a lot of different readings, and they're selected to go along with the theme of the Mass, okay? Then there's the Psalm. The Psalm often is sort of forgotten. Uh, it's usually sung, and there's a piece of the Psalm said, and then we sing uh, another piece from the Psalm, and then we say another piece, and then we sing that same part. And a lot of times people don't sing along, so because they don't sing along, they actually don't hear or say what the words are. And because they're sung, a lot of times, you know, the singers are beautiful, they say the words, they try to pronounce them correct, correctly, but with the music and everything else, and sometimes poor sound systems, you don't actually hear the words. The Psalms are very important. They're from the Old Testament. Those are the prayers that Jesus said. He didn't have a New Testament. He didn't have the Our Father. I mean, the Our Father was His. He created it. But His prayers were the Psalms, basically. And so they're very important. So read them. They're really beautiful, okay? And then there's the New Testament readings. These are the letters. Uh, Paul, who is my favorite, Peter, James, John, I think that's it. Um, and then uh, some from the Revelation as well. And also, especially during the Easter season, the Acts of the Apostles. Beautiful readings, their interpretations of the gospel of things Jesus did and said, and they're helpful for us. Uh, sometimes they're difficult to understand, especially Paul. If you read it, sometimes he have, he'll have one sentence that will go on for you know, miles and miles, it seems. Look again, read along. If you read along, you'll see where the punctuation is, you'll see where the, um, the, how the grammar is situated, and it'll help you to understand. And if you think of it as their ways, especially Paul's, of interpreting what Jesus was trying to tell us, it'll start to make sense to you. And then we finish, well, we have an Alleluia in the beginning because we're about to do the Gospel. So everybody stands for the Gospel. It's time Jesus is speaking, so we give reverence by standing. The, if there's a deacon, the deacon proclaims the Gospel, otherwise the priest will do it, never a lector. And they will, uh, they, they sing the Alleluia because we're Alleluia people. We're saying, thank you, God. Thank you. Praise to you for the word you've given us. We say the Gospel. When we introduce it, we always say, the Lord be with you. And I always try to say that meaningfully and slow because I want the Lord to be with you and I want you to know that the Lord is with you. He's present with you. And then you say, and with your spirit. And I try to acknowledge that by nodding as if to say, thank you for telling me that too and for asking the Lord to be with me. Then we read the gospel. When the gospel is done, either the priest or the deacon will give a homily. Now again, they're not there to entertain you. There are all ways of uh, giving homilies. There could be someone who's very personable uh, and very down to earth and relates to everyday life of people. There's another one who's going to be cerebral and, uh, think of, and, and, and give you very um, educational type stuff. There are all kinds of ways of talking. Some of them are monotone. Some of them are, are go a little bit longer than the norm. Um, I try to keep it to 10 minutes, but I had one priest who was a very saintly uh, priest. I loved him. He used to go on a little bit past 10 minutes and he would tell me, but I have so many good things to say. <laughs> so I, I just said, okay, fine, right? That's what they're there for. They're there to explain the gospel, to explain the theme of the Mass, or some other important theme, if that happens to be uh, what the pastor thinks is necessary, or the bishop. So listen to what they have to say. And you can help yourself before that by reading the readings before you come to Mass. Okay, you have them online, you can read them at the usccb.org site or the Magnificat, and then you um, can think to yourself, like, what would I say about this? What, what, what theme am I gathering from this? And then you compare it with what the priest or the deacon is saying, and you start to pull pieces out that mean something to you, even if it's not the most entertaining thing in the world. There, there are meanings that you can glean from them, and it's so important to get that out of it, okay? Don't read the bulletin during the homily, please. I see a lot of people doing that. Don't do that. Participate. Again, you get out of it what you put into it.